This is the Marketing Podcast Network. Stories influence, teach, and inspire us. But what about the storytellers who create them? Uncorking a Story profiles storytellers to uncover how their background and life experiences influence the stories they create. We learn what motivates them, their path to success, and what fuels them to keep creating. It all starts by asking one simple question. Where does your story begin? Welcome to Uncorking a Story. Now here's your host, Mike Carlin. Hello and welcome to Uncorking a Story. I'm your host, Mike Carlin, and today I'm excited to introduce you to Clara Pooley. Clara spent 20 years in the world of advertising before becoming a full-time writer. Her memoir, The Sober Diaries, has helped thousands of people worldwide to quit, quit drinking. Her first novel, The Authenticity Project, was a BBC Radio 2 book club pick, a New York Times bestseller, and the winner of the RNA Debut Novel Award. Joining me today to talk about her latest novel, Iona Iverson's Rules for Commuting, is Claire Pooley. Welcome to Uncorking a Story, Claire. Thank you. I'm so pleased to be here. Thank you for I'm, having me. I'm very pleased to have you here. But uh, Claire, I'm going to ask you the question I ask everybody as we kick off, which is, where does your story as an author begin? Uh, well, I mean, I'd always, I've always loved reading and writing. So if you'd asked me as a teenager what I wanted to be when I grew up, I would have said a novelist. However, um, I then ended up working in advertising for about 20 years and uh, I didn't write anything apart from, uh, you know, emails, PowerPoint presentations, text messages, that sort of thing. And then were you on uh, the creative side of advertising, the account side? What side of the business were you on? I was on the account side. So uh, so, yeah, I was a, a sort of business person. So I was a managing partner for a global advertising agency, um, J. Walter Thompson, actually. Oh, um, yes. I know J. Walter Thompson. Well, they were on uh, Third Avenue in New York City once upon a time. Yeah, I spent lots of time there. Um, so, yeah, so so I didn't write much at all until about seven years ago when um, I realized that the my alcohol habit and I'd use sort of alcohol as a way of winding down at the end of the day and sort of you know kicking back and and one I used to drink a glass of wine which turned into two glasses of wine which became three glasses of wine and I actually realized that I was drinking about a bottle of wine a day more at weekends 10 bottles a week um, which is way too much and way more than the government guidelines um, so I realized I had to quit and I had to, uh, you know, I, I felt like I had to talk to somebody, but I was too ashamed to talk to friends or family or my doctor or Alcoholics Anonymous or anybody sensible. So I uh, decided that the best form of therapy was writing. And, um, you know, I remembered how I'd written a diary when I was a teenager. And I thought, well, I'll write a diary, but I'll do it. I'll do it sort of in the modern way. I'll do a blog online uh, anonymously. So I started a blog called Mummy Was a Secret Drinker and I poured my heart out into this blog. I wrote every day and that blog became a memoir, The Sober Diaries. And uh, by that point, my new addiction was writing. So, uh, so I, you know, after The Sober Diaries was published, I switched from writing uh, nonfiction to fiction. And, and that really is the beginning of my writing story. Well, how was it finding for the sober diaries? Did you go the traditional route with an agent and and a and a you know traditional publisher? How did how did you get that published? Uh, yes, I did. So so after I'd been writing the blog for about a year, more and more people said, you know, you should publish this as a as a book because it will reach a bigger audience. And um, but I knew that in order to do that, I had to come out from behind my pseudonym because up until this point, I'd been completely anonymous. So. Uh, so yeah, it was quite frightening. I, public, I, I approached agents as myself and, uh, and then got a publishing deal with a mainstream publisher, um, Hodger and Stoughton in the UK, um, you know, under my actual name. So, so it was quite terrifying <laughs> sort of, you know, telling the world my, my deepest, worst, um, you know, most embarrassing secrets really. Well, I mean, there's something to writing, though, that requires, I mean, I believe anyway, that it requires vulnerability, uh, especially when writing memoir. Um, you have to make yourself vulnerable to to kind of share your very personal story. 
Um, and you're also opening yourself up to criticism from, from critics and readers and, and all that stuff. But uh, I mean, congratulations to you for doing that. We have actually a, a similar story. I worked in advertising for a, a fair amount of time. Oh. Uh, and I, I am a, uh, I'm a moderator. So I'm one of these guys that goes around the country and, and talks to consumers about everything. Um, I used to keep a blog called Confessions of a Focus Group Moderator. <laughs> and, um, that led to me writing my first novel um, because all, people would follow and be like, hey, you know, you really should turn this into a mm. story. Because I was capturing all the, the funny things that happen on the road and the people you meet and, and all that stuff. And uh, so it's a little bit, uh, I mean, different subject matter for sure, but um, kind of kind of a similar path. Yeah, I mean, I've spent a lot of time watching focus groups around the world. So, uh, so yeah, I, I, I know exactly the world you're talking about. Um, but I always used to sit there behind the double sided mirror with uh, with a bottle of wine while I, while I was watching. <laughs> But not anymore. Not anymore. No, no, no longer. I'm uh, here. I sit here with a glass of sparkling water. <laughs> well, there you go. And I, I'm here with my I'm here with my coffee. Um, well, tell me, what can you tell me about uh, about this book? Um, Iona Iverson's uh, Rules for Commuting. Uh, well, this book I started writing during lockdown. So um, so there we were sort of all in our individual little boxes, uh, not able to go out anywhere or, or do very much. And, you know, I realized that I, I miss friends and family, obviously, but I also missed being surrounded by groups of strangers, you know, those sorts of crowds that we used to spend so much time in. And I started thinking back to my days of commuting and you know how I used to take the train and the buses and the London underground into work every day and I remembered how I used to see the same people day in day out and I would give them little nicknames and I'd imagine what their lives were like when we weren't on our on our shared commute but I never spoke to them because the first rule of London commuting is you never talk to strangers on the train it's just you don't even make eye contact because it's kind of weird <laughs> so uh, so I never talked to them and I just started thinking while we were in lockdown I started thinking what would have happened if I had connected with some of those strangers you know what what sort of adventures might that have led to and, and really, that was the inspiration for the book, Iona Iverson's Rules for Commuting, which is about a group of strangers who have nothing in common apart from their shared commute. But one day something happens. Uh, one of them uh, chokes on a grape and nearly dies, and his life is saved by another commuter. And that sort of one act gets them all talking. And it's really about what happens after that. Wow, that sounds um, something I can somewhat relate to because I, I uh, <laughs> in addition to working in advertising, uh, I did commute into New York City uh, for many, many years on the train. And you are so right. I think the rules are the same. You don't look people in the eye. You certainly don't talk to anybody. And, mm -hmm. you know, how dare you take a phone call if you, <laughs> are, if you were on the train? I actually had a blog called uh, The Trains of Our Lives when I was commuting. Oh, uh, wonderful. It was, it was sort of, I called it the first uh, train-based soap opera. <laughs> <laughs> it, all and it all centered around this one woman who was always breaking those rules. And I used to create these little stories, but anyway. Well, that, that is very like my novel because a lot of the action actually happens on the train. So we see the sort of, there are five main characters and we see the, their lives off the train as well. But uh, the really sort of interesting stuff happens when they connect on, on their journeys. And, and it was great fun to write actually, because you know, you had, I had to work out who got on where, where and who got off where and therefore where they could meet and how long they would have between stop A and stop B in order for the action to happen. So it was, it was great fun to put together. Yeah, I can imagine. And especially, you know, something to keep you kind of mentally occupied during lockdown and, and during the pandemic and all that. Yeah, I mean, I, I found that it was, it was a great tonic really being able to at least in your head, go somewhere that was normal <laughs> and somewhere where people were, you know, were all, you know, together in a small space, breathing on each other without freaking out. So, so it was, uh, yeah, it was a, it was a great way of staying sane. Well, that, and, and I, I find that writing, you mentioned kind of writing being therapeutic earlier on in our conversation. I also find that writing is a great way to sort of enter a world where you have complete control. So if you think about, you know, during the, the height of the pandemic, we had no control over, over pretty much anything. Um, you know, we had to 
pretty much shelter in place. Um, a lot of our, most of our daily lives are interrupted, but when you're writing, you can create a world where those, you know, that reality doesn't exist. You make your own reality. And it's one of those few, I think, times in our lives where we can actually have complete control over, over the universe that we create. I find it to be very cathartic. Yeah, I agree. And, and actually, I found that writing nonfiction and fiction isn't as different as you might think, because when I was writing nonfiction, I, I really used it as a way of exploring the problems I was having and the issues I was going through. And um, writing fiction, I do very much the same thing. So, you know, I use fiction as a way of exploring things that I'm bothered about, things that I want to understand better, but I do it not through my own eyes, but through the eyes of these fictional characters, which gives you a bit of distance and allows you really to sort of, you know, explore those things in a safe way, if that makes sense. You know, it's not, you're not so exposed as you are when you're writing nonfiction. So with Iona Iverson, I was exploring one of one of the issues I explore in that book is ageism so uh, when I was in advertising I don't know the same when when you were in advertising but um, you know I found that by the time I was 30 I was the youngest woman on the board but by the time I was 40 I was one of the oldest women in the office if not the oldest woman in the office and I'd look around and I think where do all the women go <laughs> you know when they get to 40 and, um, you know, and I, I'm really bothered about the fact that men, as they get older, gain, gain gravitas, whereas women often just become invisible and irrelevant. So Iona Iverson is 57 and she is a um, uh, magazine therapist, she calls herself, or we would call her an agony aunt for a magazine. And she used to be uh, an it girl, but now describes herself as a past it girl. Um, and you know, she knows that her, her editor is trying to get rid of her. So, you know, she's trying to find a way of clinging on to an industry that no longer values her. Um, and, you know, it, it really, I found it really cathartic exploring those sorts of things through the eyes of Iona rather than through, the, you know, my own eyes, if that makes sense. Yeah. And it's, you know, you mentioned you know, similarities between writing sort of nonfiction and fiction. This is, you know, I find that fiction is a way to, to get your values and your points of view across, um, you know, th that you would consider to be true and, and certainly not fiction. But by doing it through fiction, you're almost kind of doing it in a more subtle way, um, mm. actually reaching more people. Yeah, and people can take what they want from it. You know, people can, um, you know, I love it when people send me messages saying, um, you know, reading this story really helped me because of X, Y, and Z. But it's funny how everyone takes different things, you know. So some of the things I think people will take from my stories, you know, they may not do, and they may find something completely different that they find helpful. So, um, yeah, I think I think fiction is is just as, helpful for people in many ways as, as non-fiction it just works in a different way yeah and you know i i can absolutely relate to what you say about ageism um my last employed position in sort of the realm of advertising i worked for one of the big holding companies uh, who i will not mention um but i was the only person i was one of the few people over 40 in my office um and at the end of the year when it came time to make cuts um, I was the first name on there, even though, you know, my business was the strongest out of pretty much anybody in that office. Um, I was, I was gone. Um, well, yeah, I, I understand that. And, uh, actually my agency, I don't know if they still do. In fact, they don't really exist in the same form anymore, but, um, you know, they used to have a compulsory retirement age of 55, uh, but very few people actually got to 55, you know, or they didn't get to 55 in the agency. Um, but uh, but even if they did, that was it. That was the firm cutoff. And, you know, I mean, that's incredibly young, 55. You know, you've got decades ahead of you. What do you do with it? Yeah. And I'm uh, much less than 10 years away from that number. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm even less than that away from that number. <laughs> but now, uh, now I work for myself. So, um, you know, if, if I fire myself, then I have bigger problems. <laughs> um, I, you know, what I'm curious about is having you made, having kind of your first um, experience with, with publishing, being nonfiction, being memoir. Um, what were the challenges, if any, that you faced when you said, hey, you know what, I think I want to, uh, or I know I want to write fiction? Um. 
Very little, actually. I mean, I, I think it really it really helps going having done nonfiction first uh, for several reasons. I think one is that it helps you to find your voice as an author. And you know how publishers and agents, they will always say sort of, you know, um, how important it is for an author to have a voice. And I remember reading this years ago and thinking sort of, you know, what is a, a voice? You know, what, what does it sound like? How do you get one? And actually what I discovered is when you write nonfiction, when you write about your own life, it's just, it's a way really of, of developing your own voice. So when you then go on to write fiction, hopefully that voice still comes through and you know it gives a it gives your fiction I think a very sort of personal tone um, in a way that you know uh, writers who've never written non-fiction might not might find more difficult to to uh, to develop do you do you find that do you think that's true I you know I don't know because I haven't um, I write a lot of nonfiction in in the marketing area, so I write a lot of articles that that are published. I have not written, um, although I have plans to um, uh, write something nonfiction, really based but writing, on. Yeah, but writing your blogs that would have been oh, yeah. you know, writing as yourself, you know, in your own voice, if you like. Yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. Um, yeah, and I actually never even thought about it that way. I, I, for some reason, in my head, I've always sort of divorced the two. You yeah. know, my my blogs, I don't necessarily consider creative writing, um, whereas my novels, I think, are, are much more so. But um, certainly if I didn't have the blogs, I probably wouldn't have the novels. So it's. A yeah. Yeah. So. So, I mean, I, I think I think developing a voice is is one thing that is helpful, you know, if you're doing nonfiction first. And the other thing that, you know, for me was really helpful is I just understood the business better. So, <laughs> you know, I knew how to get an agent. I knew um, I, I knew what the process of publishing was. I understood how long things took and what the different stages of editing were and all those sorts of things that, you know, actually as a, as a debut um, author, it just it's all seems like a world that that is is incomprehensible so so it really helped that you know I had contacts I had you know I knew how things worked um so so yeah I think it I can't think of I can't think of any downsides actually of having having started with non-fiction apart from the fact that you know I didn't know whether whether I was going to ever be able to write fiction <laughs> so well, with um, with your background in in marketing and advertising, I'm curious. How did you find um, promoting your work? You know, you know whether it's the sober diaries or or the novels. Did you find that it was easier to do because you had you know such a big background in advertising marketing, or was it more challenging than you thought it would be? Um, I guess I haven't found it hard. I think because of you know, partly because of my background, I just find it really time consuming. So, you know, I think in the old days, when you wrote a novel, um, you would give it to your publishers, and they would do the sort of marketing and publicity for you. And they might send you on a, on a sort of, you know, roadshow with, you know, meeting, meeting people and, and, uh, you know, going to booksellers and so on and so forth. But, you know, we didn't have social media in those days. Um, and now, you know, with the advent of social media, which is incredibly powerful when it comes to, you know, talking about and, and selling books, um, you know, you are expected to do a lot more of it yourself. And it takes, a, it takes up an, a huge amount of time. And, you know, I, the more, the more followers I, I gather on social media, the more messages I get, and I absolutely want to reply to all of them. But I can't possibly reply to everything. It would just take far too long. And so I have this sort of, I have this underlying sense of guilt always about the people that I haven't contacted. So if anyone is listening to this who has sent me a message that I haven't replied to, I'm so sorry. Um, and I will do my best to get round to it. But, uh, but I do feel overwhelmed by it sometimes. Yeah, I think you're right. I think, um, you know, once upon a time, uh, the, the big publishing companies would, you know, put you on those book tours and do a lot of it for you. But now, um, even, you know, people who I've talked to who are, you know, 40 million books sold, um, they, they're doing it all themselves, not all themselves, but, you know, so much of that responsibility, which I think a lot of new authors don't understand, you know, it does fall on their shoulders. 
Mm, yeah, I mean, I get people who, uh, you know, when I do reply to people, which, you know, as I said, I, I always try to do, I do get people coming back to me saying, oh, I didn't think it would be you. I thought that you'd have somebody else who, who replied to messages. Says, nope, it's me. <laughs> Well, um, I do like to, uh, you know, say that this is about the stories behind the story. So I am curious to know a little bit more about you. So Claire, I have some questions uh, that I'm going to ask, starting with uh, some pop culture. So I'm curious, when you were growing up, what were some of your favorite television shows? Oh, gosh. Um, well, as a sort of young adult, I was obsessed with Friends. That was so I have watched every episode of Friends at least once and, you know, actually several times, three or four times, possibly. And my kids have now all started watching Friends. So uh, so, you know, so I've been watching those episodes again, sort of with them, which is which is great. Um, so so that was absolutely one of my favorites. And, you know, as a teenager, I loved a good soap. I loved an, an you know ongoing family saga. So Dallas and Dynasty and you know all of those. I was sort of totally addicted to. Um, if you go back even younger than that, Scooby Doo. Um, and hey, I just <laughs> I've just seen all over social media that Velma has finally come out as a lesbian. So no, <laughs> I no idea. Yeah, I mean, I, so we always we suspected. Go. We always suspected, but. Well, apparently now now it has been finally confirmed. Uh, but Scooby Doo was was a great favorite. Um, so yeah, so I guess I guess that sort of that that ages me somewhat. Because <laughs> yeah, no, it 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 uh, the the thing I find fascinating about Scooby Doo, um, yeah, because they were always like hunting down some ghost or you know something supernatural, and it always turned out to be like a you know a human being who was up to no good. Yet, yet, you know, they had a talking dog, right? So why not let there be a real ghost if you have a talking dog? <laughs> I've overthought. Yeah. yeah, yeah, no, it's you always thought one day they're going to not be able to crack it because it will be real. Right. But um, yeah, no, I, I, I think that was Scooby-Doo is a great example of sort of uh, great characterization. I mean, each of the characters absolutely had their own language, their own mannerisms, their own sort of little quirks and foibles. And, you know, and I love the way that there was sort of that the structure was pretty much always the same. Um, but the story within that was very different. Yeah. And then some of the, you know, some of the phrases that were just, you would come back over and over again. I would have gotten away with it too, if it wasn't for you pesky kids. <laughs> That's right. Right after they pull the mask off of the head. <laughs> um, how about music? What did you, uh, what did you listen to when you were growing up? Ah, uh, now I have a story for you here because one of my favorite bands as a teenager was ABBA. So this was back in the days when ABBA were really huge and I was obsessed with ABBA and I had posters all over my bedroom. Um, and then when I was 11, which was, okay, I'm going to, I, I, I'll let you into to the, to my age here because I was 11 in 1980 um, and ABBA were doing a, the Voulez Vous tour back then. Um, and I was, I was sitting in a in a German lesson at school and um, the school secretary came in and she said, uh, I've got a letter for Claire Pooley's parents. And I thought, oh, God, I've done something really bad again. <laughs> you know, and I'm in deep trouble, obviously, because there's a letter for my parents. Nobody else has got a letter for their parents, just me. Um, and I, I was in two minds at what to do with this letter. I thought maybe I'll throw it away and just pretend I never got it. But I thought, well, I'm going to be found out. So, so I gave it to my parents and they opened the letter and it said, you have been selected to sing in ABBA's backing group on their Voulez Vous tour <laughs> at the Forêt Nationale, which was at the time I was living in Brussels. And the Forêt Nationale was the huge stadium, uh, sat 30,000 people and ABBA were doing a concert at the stadium and they wanted a group of kids to sing in the um, background of um, uh, the chorus of the song, I Have a Dream. So if you listen to the song, I Have a Dream, you can hear these kids sort of singing in the chorus. And I was one of those kids. 
Oh my goodness. Did, now, did you, was it a contest that you had to enter? Did you have to audition somehow? No, no. It's just that because I happened to be, you know, I was at the British school in Brussels and they wanted kids who, who spoke English. So, and I just happened to be in the school choir. So it was just a series of lucky, lucky coincidences. Yeah, that's, that's, I love it. My, uh, my kids. So I have three 20 year olds. We have triplets. And wow. Yes. That's hard work. Yes, it, 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 it was. Uh, but when they were when they were young, we didn't listen to all the, like the, you know, the kids music, you know, whatever the Raffi or Barney or anything. We had them on a diet of like the Beatles, a um, little bit of Rod Stewart and um, and ABBA. The kids loved ABBA. Um, mm. And I mean, the music is I mean, it's so infectious. But um, I remember watching the Mamma Mia movies with them a few years ago. It actually brought a tear to my eye because I just remembered like their little tiny faces in the back of the van, um, you know, singing along, bopping their head to like Dancing Queen and Fernando. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they're, they're, they're songs that have just gone the distance, haven't they? You yeah. know, it's, yeah. uh, it's amazing that they're still they're still so popular now. Um, so. So, yeah, so they were my they were my my big sort of. Um, uh, crush when I was uh, when I was uh, in my uh, my sort of early teens and that was you know that for me was just a, a dream come true that whole you know so I met them all I got their autographs um, yeah it was amazing that's great um, how about feeding your inner child I have this belief that all of us have inner children inside of us that need to be fed from time to time uh, do you agree and if so how do you feed your inner child oh what an interesting question um Yes, I do. Um, and uh, how do I feed my inner child? I mean, I think I think a lot of for me, it's it's a lot of a lot of it is about creativity because that's what I loved when I was a child. I loved, you know, again, it comes back to reading and writing. That is, you know, that was what I did. I spent my whole time doing when I was little. And that's what I do as a as a career now, which is the biggest joy ever. Uh, but, you know, also anything else that involves, you know, um, being creative, painting, um, you know, sort of making things. Uh, um, turning turning items of rubbish into sculptures, you know all those things that you do with your kids. <laughs> yeah, no, that sounds uh, that sounds great. I, I wonder what happens to us as we, you know, as we you know um, grow up and kind of childhood is more in the rearview mirror. We lose some of that natural creativity, or we hide it. Uh, I don't think we lose it. Maybe it's just that we hide it and we don't share it as much anymore. But um, well, I think uh, I think we become more embarrassed and more worried about uh about being you know being judged and not being good enough and you know when you're a kid you don't worry about that stuff you just give everything a go and uh yeah I mean I think uh, I think giving everything a go is a really important thing to do yeah giving it a go um what about um the blank page let's say you're you're sitting down you need to write something um whether it's a you know blank sheet of paper or computer screen how do you feel when you're staring at the blank page? Um, oh, you know, it it depends. Sometimes I see it as a wonderful opportunity, and it could a blank page can become anything. And sometimes I see it as a terrible tyranny. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh no, what am I going to do to fill this? Um, you know, I tend not to stare at a blank page. So what I will do if if I'm um, if if I'm if I'm you know, need, if I need to write the next chapter of whatever I'm working on, um, I will wake up very early. So I, I wake up at about five in the morning and I don't turn the lights on. I don't even open my eyes. I just lie in the dark and I picture what the next scene of whatever I'm writing on. So it's, it's almost... Um, it's almost like a, a sort of dream state, you know, when I, I sort of imagine all the details of, of what happens next. And then I go downstairs and when I'm looking at the blank page, I have that in my head still and I just translate that onto the page. So actually I do all the writing in a way on in my head before I get as far as the page. If I'm, you know, by the time I'm looking at the page, I want to know exactly what's going to be on it. 
Yeah, a little guided, almost like a guided visualization somehow. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's, it's interesting, um, you know, sort of Mary Wolfson, Wolfenscroft, oh, I can never, I never pronounce her name, who wrote, <laughs> who wrote, uh, um, sorry, Mary Shelley, who wrote um, uh, Frankenstein. Yeah. You know, she talks about how she dreamt that story. And actually, when you, when you um, read more about it, she didn't mean that she was completely asleep and dreamt the whole thing. She she it came to her in a dream in a dream state so she was sort of half awake half asleep and that's that's the way that I like to write things in my head when I'm half awake half asleep and you're thinking in a much more lateral and interesting way than you do when you're completely awake yeah I think um a lot of people limit writing just to the actual act of sitting down and typing or writing, but writing, you know, for many of us happens in the shower. It happens when we're relaxing and it, ha it happens for me when I'm on a long run, my, my brain mm. will start turning and I'll start thinking of things. And even though I'm not physically writing, I am creating. Yeah. Same. I, I find movement is really helpful. If I'm stuck, if I don't know what's going to happen next, I will uh, go for a walk. Um, and, um, uh, you know, and and that really helps. There's something about movement that helps unstick your your you know your creativity. I think. But do you are you a plotter or a pantser? You know, do you do you know what you're going to write in advance? I I tend to uh, have an outline, but my outline has a lot of breathing room. Mm. Uh, so that as I'm as I'm discovering who these characters really are and what this story is really about. I have the ability to sort of pivot, you know, if I need to, um, but it does help me to know the big beats of where it's going. Mm. Yeah, I'm I'm kind of similar in that I sort of know the beginning, the middle and the end. And I know roughly who my characters are and what their general character arcs are. But all the detail, I deliberately leave um, just to see what happens, because for me, the real magic happens when your characters start dictating the story to you rather yeah. than you dictating it to them and and I sort of have this theory that you can never really surprise a reader unless you can surprise yourself yeah. <laughs> so you know if I know if I know there's a big twist coming up I feel that I accidentally let clues slip whereas if I don't know that it's coming the reader won't know it's coming either yeah, in that way, you you probably have as much fun as your readers do, kind of reading your. Yeah, work. yeah, and I think I think as a reader, you can tell that. I think you can see when the author's actually having fun. Um, maybe not, but that's my theory. <laughs> and then you know, lastly, what um, if you could go back in time and you know bend the ear of the young uh, Claire Pooley? Um, what are some words of advice you would give your younger self if you had the opportunity to do so? Oh, I'd say buy shares in Apple because they're going to do really well. <laughs> um, uh, no, seriously, um, I would uh, I, I would say um, be brave because I spent most of my life uh, being fearful of making mistakes and failing fear of failure was a big issue so part of the reason I didn't write a novel for um, you know the first uh, nearly 50 years of my life is because I didn't think I'd be able to do it or I thought if I did do it nobody would want to read it and you know it's only now really that I realized that um, you know the only way of being sure of failure is not to try in the first place um, and, you know, what are you going to lose? You know, I, I actually realize now that the things that have made me most scared in my life are the things that uh, I have, you know, I have been the greatest thrills. Um, and uh, I think it's Will Smith, actually, who said, um, on the other side of your greatest fear lies all the best things in life. And it's very true. Yeah, that's a wonderful sentiment. That's a wonderful sentiment and a great quote to uh, end our conversation on. Um, so actually, before I let you go, Claire, um, where can people buy Iona Iverson's Rules for Commuting? Uh, well, hopefully in most good bookshops <laughs> and, uh, and you know, on all the usual places online. So, uh, so yes. And, and if you do buy it, I really hope you enjoy it. And do get in contact and I will try my very best to reply. <laughs> and how can people find you, uh, either a website or social media? 
so I have a website, which is clairepooley.com. Um, but social media, I'm on Twitter um, at, uh, at cpooleywriter. And I'm on Instagram, uh, which is at Claire underscore Pooley. So, uh, so yeah, you can find me in any of those places. Well, Claire, thank you uh, very much for letting me uncork your story. I had, a, I had a good time. Oh, I really enjoyed chatting to you. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to Uncorking a Story. If you'd like more information about today's guest or to find out more about Mike, go to uncorkingastory.com. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe, rate, and review us at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Tune in every week to hear Mike Carlin uncork a new story.